Section 2 of The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Don't mistake your vocation. The safest plan and the one most sure of success for the young man starting in life is to select the vocation which is most congenial to his tastes. Parents and guardians are often quite too negligent in regard to this. It is very common for a father to say, for example, I have five boys, I will make Billy a clergyman, John a lawyer, Tom a doctor, and Dick a farmer. He then goes into town and looks about to see what he will do with Sammy. He returns home and says, Sammy, I see watchmaking is a nice genteel business. I think I will make you a goldsmith. He does this regardless of Sam's natural inclinations or genius. We are all, no doubt, born for a wise purpose. There is as much diversity in our brains as in our countenances. Some are born natural mechanics, while some have great aversion to machinery. Let a dozen boys of ten years get together, and you will soon observe two or three are whittling out some ingenious device, working with locks or complicated machinery. When they were but five years old, their father could find no toy to please them like a puzzle. They are natural mechanics. But the other eight or nine boys have different aptitudes. I belong to the latter class. I never had the slightest love for mechanism. On the contrary, I have a sort of abhorrence for complicated machinery. I never had ingenuity enough to whittle a cider tap so it would not leak. I never could make a pen that I could write with or understand the principle of a steam engine. If a man was to take such a boy as I was and attempt to make a watchmaker of him, the boy might, after an apprenticeship of five or seven years, be able to take a part and put together a watch. But all through life he would be working uphill and seizing every excuse for leaving his work and idling away his time. Watchmaking is repulsive to him. Unless a man enters upon the vocation intended for him by nature and best suited to his peculiar genius, he cannot succeed. I am glad to believe that the majority of persons do find their right vocation. Yet we see many who have mistaken their calling from the blacksmith up or down to the clergyman. You will see, for instance, that extraordinary linguist, the learned blacksmith, who ought to have been a teacher of languages, and you may have seen lawyers, doctors and clergymen who were better fitted by nature for the anvil or the lapstone. Select the right location. After securing the right vocation, you must be careful to select the proper location. You may have been cut out for a hotel keeper, and they say it requires a genius to know how to keep a hotel. You might conduct a hotel like clockwork and provide satisfactorily for five hundred guests every day. Yet if you should locate your house in a small village where there is no railroad communication or public travel, the location would be your ruin. It is equally important that you do not commence business where there are already enough to meet all demands in the same occupation. I remember a case which illustrates this subject. When I was in London in 1858, I was passing down Holborn with an English friend and came to the penny shows. They had immense cartoons outside, portraying the wonderful curiosities to be seen all for a penny. Being a little in the show line myself, I said, let us go in here. We soon found ourselves in the presence of the illustrious showman, and he proved to be the sharpest man in that line I had ever met. He told us some extraordinary stories in reference to his bearded ladies, his albinos and his armadillos, which we could hardly believe, but thought it better to believe it than look after the proof. He finally begged to call our attention to some wax statuary, and showed us a lot of the dirtiest and filthiest wax figures imaginable. They looked as if they had not seen water since the deluge. 
"What is there so wonderful about your statuary?" I asked. "I beg you not to speak so satirically," he replied. "Sir, these are not Madame Tussaud's wax figures, all covered with gilt and tinsel and imitation diamonds, and copied from engravings and photographs. Mine, sir, were taken from life. Whenever you look upon one of those figures." You may consider that you are looking upon the living individual. Glancing casually at them, I saw one labelled Henry the Eighth, and feeling a little curious upon seeing that it looked like Calvin Edson, the living skeleton, I said, "Do you call that Henry the Eighth?" He replied, "Certainly, sir. It was taken from life at Hampton Court by special order of His Majesty on such a day." He would have given the hour of the day if I had insisted. I said, "Everybody knows that Henry the Eighth was a great stout old king, and that figure is lean and lank. What do you say to that?" "Why," he replied, "you would be lean and lank yourself if you sat there as long as he has." There was no resisting such arguments. I said to my English friend, "Let us go out. Do not tell him who I am." I show the white feather. He beats me. He followed us to the door, and seeing the rabble in the street, he called out, "Ladies and gentlemen, I beg to draw your attention to the respectable character of my visitors," pointing to us as we walked away. I called upon him a couple of days afterwards, told him who I was, and said, "My friend, you are an excellent showman, but you have selected a bad location." He replied. This is true, sir. I feel that all my talents are thrown away. But what can I do? You can go to America, I replied. You can give full play to your faculties over there. You will find plenty of elbow room in America. I will engage you for two years. After that, you will be able to go on your own account. He accepted my offer and remained two years in my New York museum. He then went to New Orleans and carried on a travelling show business during the summer. Today he is worth sixty thousand dollars simply because he selected the right vocation and also secured the proper location. The old proverb says, "Three removes are as bad as a fire," but when a man is in the fire, it matters but little how soon or how often he removes. Avoid debt. Young men starting in life should avoid running into debt. There is scarcely anything that drags a person down like debt. It is a slavish position to get in. Yet we find many a young man hardly out of his teens running in debt. He meets a chum and says, "Look at this! I have got trusted for a new suit of clothes." He seems to look upon the clothes as so much given to him. Well, it frequently is so, but if he succeeds in paying and then gets trusted again, he is adopting a habit which will keep him in poverty through life. Debt robs a man of his self-respect and makes him almost despise himself. Grunting and groaning and working for what he has eaten up or worn out, and now when he is called upon to pay up, he has nothing to show for his money. This is properly termed working for a dead horse. I do not speak of merchants buying and selling on credit, or of those who buy on credit in order to turn the purchase to a profit. The old Quaker said to his farmer son, "John, never get trusted, but if thee gets trusted for anything, let it be for manure, because that will help thee pay it back again." Mr. Beecher advised young men to get in debt if they could to a small amount in the purchase of land in the country districts. If a young man, he says, will only get in debt for some land and then get married, these two things will keep him straight, or nothing will. This may be safe to a limited extent, but getting in debt for what you eat and drink and wear is to be avoided. Some families have a foolish habit of getting credit at the stores, and thus frequently purchase many things which might have been dispensed with. It is all very well to say, "I have got trusted for sixty days, and if I don't have the money, the creditor will think nothing about it." 
There is no class of people in the world who have such good memories as creditors. When the sixty days run out, you will have to pay. If you do not pay, you will break your promise and probably resort to a falsehood. You may make some excuse or get in debt elsewhere to pay it, but that only involves you the deeper. A good-looking, lazy young fellow was the apprentice boy Horatio. His employer said, Horatio, did you ever see a snail? I think I have, he drawled out. You must have met him then, for I'm sure you never overtook one, said the boss. Your creditor will meet you or overtake you and say, Now, my young friend, you agreed to pay me. You have not done it. You must give me your note. You give the note on interest, and it commences working against you. It is a dead horse. The creditor goes to bed at night and wakes up in the morning better off than when he retired to bed, because his interest has increased during the night. But you grow poorer while you are sleeping, for the interest is accumulating against you. Money is in some respects like fire. It is a very excellent servant, but a terrible master. When you have it mastering you, when interest is constantly piling up against you, it will keep you down in the worst kind of slavery. But let money work for you and you have the most devoted servant in the world. It is no eye-servant. There is nothing animate or inanimate that will work so faithfully as money when placed at interest, well secured. It works night and day, and in wet or dry weather. I was born in the Blue Law state of Connecticut, where the old Puritans had laws so rigid that it was said they fined a man for kissing his wife on Sunday. Yet these rich old Puritans would have thousands of dollars at interest, and on Saturday night would be worth a certain amount. On Sunday they would go to church and perform all the duties of a Christian. On waking up on Monday morning, they would find themselves considerably richer than the Saturday night previous, simply because their money placed at interest had worked faithfully for them all day Sunday according to law. Do not let it work against you. If you do, there is no chance for success in life so far as money is concerned. John Randolph, the eccentric Virginian, once exclaimed in Congress, Mr. Speaker, I have discovered the philosopher's stone. Pay as you go. This is indeed nearer to the philosopher's stone than any alchemist has ever yet arrived. Persevere. When a man is in the right path, he must persevere. I speak of this because there are some persons who are born tired, naturally lazy and possessing no self-reliance and no perseverance. But they can cultivate these qualities, as Davy Crockett said, this thing remember when I am dead, be sure you are right, then go ahead. It is this go ahead this determination not to let the horrors or the blues take possession of you so as to make you relax your energies in the struggle for independence, which you must cultivate. How many have almost reached the goal of their ambition? but losing faith in themselves have relaxed their energies, and the golden prize has been lost for ever. It is no doubt often true, as Shakespeare says, there is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. If you hesitate, some bolder hand will stretch out before you and get the prize. Remember the proverb of Solomon, he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Perseverance is sometimes but another word for self-reliance. Many persons naturally look on the dark side of life and borrow trouble. They are born so. Then they ask for advice, and they will be governed by one wind and blown by another, and cannot rely upon themselves. Until you can get so that you can rely upon yourself, 
you need not expect to succeed. I have known men personally who have met with pecuniary reverses and absolutely committed suicide because they thought they could never overcome their misfortune. But I have known others who have met more serious financial difficulties and have bridged them over by simple perseverance, aided by a firm belief that they were doing justly and that providence would overcome evil with good. You will see this illustrated in any sphere of life. Take two generals, both understand military tactics, both educated at West Point, if you please, both equally gifted. Yet one having this principle of perseverance and the other lacking it, the former will succeed in his profession while the latter will fail. One may hear the cry, the enemy are coming and they have got cannon. Got cannon? says the hesitating general. Yes. Then halt every man. He wants time to reflect. His hesitation is his ruin. The enemy passes unmolested or overwhelms him, while on the other hand the general of pluck, perseverance and self-reliance goes into battle with a will, and amid the clash of arms, the booming of cannon, the shrieks of the wounded and the moans of the dying, you will see this man persevering, going on, cutting and slashing his way through with unwavering determination, inspiring his soldiers to deeds of fortitude, valour and triumph. Whatever you do, do it with all your might. Work at it, if necessary, early and late, in season and out of season, not leaving a stone unturned and never deferring for a single hour that which can be done just as well now. The old proverb is full of truth and meaning. Whatever is worth doing at all is worth doing well. Many a man acquires a fortune by doing his business thoroughly, while his neighbour remains poor for life because he only half does it. Ambition, energy, Industry, perseverance are indispensable requisites for success in business. Fortune always favours the brave and never helps a man who does not help himself. It won't do to spend your time like Mr. Micawber in waiting for something to turn up. To such men, one of two things usually turns up, the poorhouse or the jail for idleness breeds bad habits and clothes a man in rags. The poor spendthrift vagabond said to a rich man, I have discovered there is money enough in the world for all of us if it was equally divided. This must be done, and we shall all be happy together. But, was the response, if everybody was like you, it would be spent in two months, and what would you do then? Oh, divide again! Keep dividing, of course. I was recently reading in a London paper an account of a like philosophic pauper who was kicked out of a cheap boarding house because he could not pay his bill, but he had a roll of papers sticking out of his coat pocket, which, upon examination, proved to be his plan for paying off the national debt of England without the aid of a penny. People have got to do as Cromwell said not only trust in providence, but keep the powder dry. Do your part of the work or you cannot succeed. Mohammed, one night, while encamping in the desert, overheard one of his fatigued followers remark, I will loose my camel and trust it to God. No, no, not so, said the prophet, tie thy camel and trust it to God. Do all you can for yourselves and then trust to providence or luck or whatever you please to call it for the rest. Depend upon your own personal exertions. The eye of the employer is often worth more than the hands of a dozen employees. In the nature of things an agent cannot be so faithful to his employer as to himself. Many who are employers will call to mind instances where the best employees have overlooked important points which could not have escaped their own observation as a proprietor. 
No man has a right to expect to succeed in life unless he understands his business, and nobody can understand his business thoroughly unless he learns it by personal application and experience. A man may be a manufacturer. He has got to learn the many details of his business personally. He will learn something every day, and he will find he will make mistakes nearly every day. And these very mistakes are helps to him in the way of experiences if he but heeds them. He will be like the Yankee tin peddler who, having been cheated as to quality in the purchase of his merchandise, said, "All right, there's a little information to be gained every day. I will never be cheated in that way again." Thus, a man buys his experience, and it is the best kind if not purchased at too dear a rate. I hold that every man should, like Cuvier, the French naturalist, thoroughly know his business. So proficient was he in the study of natural history that you might bring to him the bone, or even a section of a bone of an animal which he had never seen described, and reasoning from analogy, he would be able to draw a picture of the object from which the bone had been taken. On one occasion, his students attempted to deceive him. They rolled one of their number in a cow skin and put him under the professor's table as a new specimen. When the philosopher came into the room, some of the students asked him what animal it was. Suddenly, the animal said, "I am the devil, and I am going to eat you." It was but natural that Cuvier should desire to classify this creature, and examining it intently, he said, "Divided hoof, graminivorous." It cannot be done. He knew that an animal with a split hoof must live upon grass and grain or other kind of vegetation, and would not be inclined to eat flesh, dead or alive. So he considered himself perfectly safe. The possession of a perfect knowledge of your business is an absolute necessity in order to ensure success. Among the maxims of the elder Rothschild was one, an apparent paradox: be cautious and bold. This seems to be a contradiction in terms, but it is not, and there is great wisdom in the maxim. It is, in fact, a condensed statement of what I have already said. It is to say, you must exercise your caution in laying your plans, but be bold in carrying them out. A man who is all caution will never dare to take hold and be successful, and a man who is all boldness is merely reckless and must eventually fail. A man may go on change and make fifty or one hundred thousand dollars in speculating in stocks at a single operation, but if he has simple boldness without caution, it is mere chance, and what he gains today he will lose tomorrow. You must have both the caution and the boldness to ensure success. The Rothschilds have another maxim: never have anything to do with an unlucky man or place. That is to say, never have anything to do with a man or place which never succeeds, because although a man may appear to be honest and intelligent, yet if he tries this or that thing and always fails. It is on account of some fault or infirmity that you may not be able to discover, but nevertheless, which must exist. There is no such thing in the world as luck. There never was a man who could go out in the morning and find a purse full of gold in the street today and another tomorrow, and so on day after day. He may do so once in his life. But so far as mere luck is concerned, he is as liable to lose it as to find it. Like causes produce like effects. If a man adopts the proper methods to be successful, luck will not prevent him. If he does not succeed, there are reasons for it, although perhaps he may not be able to see them. Use the best tools. Men in engaging employees should be careful to get the best. Understand, you cannot have two good tools to work with, and there is no tool you should be so particular about as living tools. 
If you get a good one, it is better to keep him than keep changing. He learns something every day, and you are benefited by the experience he acquires. He is worth more to you this year than last, and he is the last man to part with, provided his habits are good and he continues faithful. If, as he gets more valuable, he demands an exorbitant increase of salary, on the supposition that you can't do without him, let him go. Whenever I have such an employee, I always discharge him, first to convince him that his place may be supplied, and second, because he is good for nothing if he thinks he is invaluable and cannot be spared. But I would keep him, if possible, in order to profit from the result of his experience. An important element in an employee is the brain. You can see bills up, hands wanted, but hands are not worth a great deal without heads. Mr. Beecher illustrates this in this wise. An employee offers his services by saying, I have a pair of hands and one of my fingers thinks. That is very good, says the employer. Another man comes along and says he has two fingers that think. Ah, that is better. But a third calls in and says that all his fingers and thumbs think that is better still. Finally, another steps in and says, I have a brain that thinks. I think all over. I am a thinking as well as a working man. You are the man I want, says the delighted employer. Those men who have brains and experience are therefore the most valuable and not to be readily parted with. It is better for them as well as yourself to keep them at reasonable advances in their salaries from time to time. Don't get above your business. Young men, after they get through their business training or apprenticeship, instead of pursuing their avocation and rising in their business, will often lie about doing nothing. They say, I have learned my business, but I am not going to be a hireling. What is the object of learning my trade or profession unless I establish myself? Have you capital to start with? No, but I am going to have it. How are you going to get it? I will tell you confidentially. I have a wealthy old aunt, and she will die pretty soon, but if she does not, I expect to find some rich old man who will lend me a few thousands to give me a start. If I only get the money to start with, I will do well. There is no greater mistake than when a young man believes he will succeed with borrowed money. Why? Because every man's experience coincides with that of Mr. Astor, who said, it was more difficult for him to accumulate his first thousand dollars than all the succeeding millions that made up his colossal fortune. Money is good for nothing unless you know the value of it by experience. Give a boy twenty thousand dollars and put him in business, and the chances are that he will lose every dollar of it before he is a year older. Like buying a ticket in the lottery and drawing a prize, it is easy come, easy go. He does not know the value of it. Nothing is worth anything unless it costs effort. Without self-denial and economy, patience and perseverance, and commencing with capital which you have not earned, you are not sure to succeed in accumulating. Young men, instead of waiting for dead men's shoes, should be up and doing, for there is no class of persons who are so unaccommodating in regard to dying as these rich old people, and it is fortunate for the expectant heirs that it is so. Nine out of ten of the rich men of our country today started out in life as poor boys with determined wills, industry, perseverance, economy, and good habits. They went on gradually, made their own money, and saved it, and this is the best way to acquire a fortune. Stephen Girard started life as a poor cabin boy and died worth nine million dollars. A.T. Stewart was a poor Irish boy. Now he pays taxes on a million and a half dollars of income per year. John Jacob Astor was a poor farmer boy and died worth twenty millions. Cornelius Vanderbilt began life rowing a boat from Staten Island to New York. 
Now he presents our government with a steamship worth a million of dollars, and he is worth fifty millions. There is no royal road to learning, says the proverb, and I may say it is equally true there is no royal road to wealth, but I think there is a royal road to both. The road to learning is a royal one. The road that enables the student to expand his intellect and add every day to his stock of knowledge until, in the pleasant process of intellectual growth, he is able to solve the most profound problems, to count the stars, to analyze every atom of the globe, and to measure the firmament. This is a regal highway, and it is the only road worth traveling. So, in regard to wealth, Go on in confidence, study the rules, and above all things, study human nature. For the proper study of mankind is man. And you will find that while expanding the intellect and the muscles, your enlarged experience will enable you every day to accumulate more and more principle, which will increase itself by interest and otherwise, until you arrive at a state of independence. You will find, as a general thing, that the poor boys get rich, and the rich boys get poor. For instance, a rich man at his decease leaves a large estate to his family. His eldest sons, who have helped him earn his fortune, know by experience the value of money, and they take their inheritance and add to it. The separate portions of the young children are placed at interest, and the little fellows are patted on the head and told a dozen times a day, you are rich, you will never have to work, you can always have whatever you wish, for you were born with a golden spoon in your mouth. The young heir soon finds out what that means. He has the finest dresses and playthings, he is crammed with sugar candies and almost killed with kindness, and he passes from school to school, petted and flattered. He becomes arrogant and self-conceited, abuses his teachers and carries everything with a high hand. He knows nothing of the real value of money, having never earned any, but he knows all about the golden spoon business. At college he invites his poor fellow students to his room, where he wines and dines them. He is cajoled and caressed, and called a glorious good fellow because he is so lavish of his money. He gives his game suppers, drives his fast horses, invites his chums to fates and parties, determined to have lots of good times. He spends the night in frolics and debauchery, and leads off his companions with the familiar song, We Won't Go Home Till Morning. He gets them to join him in pulling down signs, taking gates from their hinges and throwing them into backyards and horse ponds. If the police arrest them, he knocks them down, is taken to the lock-up, and joyfully foots the bills. Ha! <laughs> my boys, he cries, what is the use of being rich if you can't enjoy yourself? He might more truly say if you can't make a fool of yourself, but he is fast, hates slow things, and don't see it. Young men loaded down with other people's money are almost sure to lose all they inherit, and they acquire all sorts of bad habits which in the majority of cases ruin them in health, purse, and character. In this country one generation follows another, and the poor of today are rich in the next generation, or the third. Their experience leads them on, and they become rich and they leave vast riches to their young children. These children, having been reared in luxury, are inexperienced and get poor, and after long experience another generation comes on and gathers up riches again in turn. And thus history repeats itself, and happy is he who by listening to the experience of others avoids the rocks and shoals on which so many have been wrecked. In England the business makes the man. If a man in that country is a mechanic or working man, he is not recognized as a gentleman. On the occasion of my first appearance before Queen Victoria, the Duke of Wellington asked me what sphere in life General Tom Thumb's parents were in. 
His father is a carpenter, I replied. Oh, I had heard he was a gentleman, was the response of his grace. In this republican country, the man makes the business. No matter whether he is a blacksmith, a shoemaker, a farmer, banker or lawyer, so long as his business is legitimate, he may be a gentleman. So any legitimate business is a double blessing. It helps the man engaged in it and also helps others. The farmer supports his own family, but he also benefits the merchant or mechanic who needs the products of his farm. The tailor not only makes a living by his trade, but he also benefits the farmer, the clergyman, and others who cannot make their own clothing. But all these classes of men may be gentlemen. The great ambition should be to excel all others engaged in the same occupation. The college student who was about graduating said to an old lawyer, I have not yet decided which profession I will follow. Is your profession full? The basement is much crowded, but there is plenty of room upstairs, was the witty and truthful reply. No profession, trade or calling is overcrowded in the upper story. Wherever you find the most honest and intelligent merchant or banker, or the best lawyer, the best doctor, the best clergyman, the best shoemaker, carpenter or anything else, that man is most sought for and has always enough to do. As a nation, Americans are too superficial. They are striving to get rich quickly and do not generally do their business as substantially and thoroughly as they should. But whoever excels all others in his own line, if his habits are good and his integrity undoubted, cannot fail to secure abundant patronage and the wealth that naturally follows. Let your motto then always be Excelsior, for by living up to it there is no such word as fail. Learn something useful. Every man should make his son or daughter learn some useful trade or profession, so that in these days of changing fortunes of being rich today and poor tomorrow, they may have something tangible to fall back upon. This provision might save many persons from misery who by some unexpected turn of fortune have lost all their means. End of section 2 Thank <laughs> you.